This episode is an exploration of my personal attachment to food, the legacy of food in my ancestry, and how to clear out beliefs around food and nourishment. Following the episode this week are three healing experientials to offer guidance in talking to your gut, exploring your own ancestral legacy of food that lives in your bones, and moving through food cravings. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Embody Podcast, a show about remembering and embodying your true nature, inner wisdom, embodied healing, and self-love. My name is Candace Wu, and I'm a holistic healing facilitator, intuitive coach, and artist sharing my personal journey of vulnerability, offering meditations and guided healing support, and having co-creative conversations with healers and wellness practitioners from all over the world. This episode is brought to you by the Soul Body Women's Retreat in October 2018. And this retreat is truly special because not only does it connect soul and body and support you in integration of who you deeply are, but moving beyond soul and into spirit, into pure consciousness, so that you can free yourself of any binds and limits that come connected with soul or body. Within the elements of sky and earth, in Zion National Park, we will immerse ourselves in sacred healing and connection. For this and future retreats, you can find out more information at candicewu.com slash retreats. And your support in joining or sharing your retreat helps me to make more healing albums, more content, and podcast episodes. I'm truly appreciative for your support. One of the things that I love the most about traveling is that when I get to a new place, I see myself. I get to see what my beliefs are, what my attachments are, and what I know, what I don't know, what I thought I knew. And all of that gets stirred up a bit until I learn the new things that this place offers me. And then that settles again. This fits right in with a recent astrology appointment that I had where the astrologer told me that because I have Pluto in my chart in a particular way, that I have chosen in this life or that this life has given me the experience of moving through growth as fast as I possibly can, as fast as humanly possible. And I have definitely experienced that. It was very affirming as well as relieving to hear that. And this time on my travels was no different. I definitely was thrown for quite a loop. And this is what this podcast is about this week, about my attachment to food that came up and all of the belief sets and energies that came through with traveling to Lombok, Indonesia. So just to start to share my story of food with you is that all of my life I've used food to comfort myself, to nourish, and to have a treat. When I was young, I felt very alone and having chips, sweets, anything junk food-wise, whether that was American junk food or Chinese junk food, would just help me through the day. Of course, I didn't know I was using food that way, but I was sneaking food into my room and always choosing the crunchy snacks and the sweets. Every time we went to the dentist, my mom would be really upset because I had terrible cavities. When I was about school age, I wanted American food and practically begged my family to make macaroni and cheese, pizza, spaghetti, and anything that just seemed quote unquote regular and normal. And whenever I brought Chinese food to school, it was met with different reactions that were really upsetting to me. So I just didn't want to go there. Food in my family is a really big deal. Practically everything centers around a meal. Meeting up centers around meals. And I don't think that's unlike other families, but there's this sense of safety and luxury that comes with having plentiful food for everybody, which wasn't the case three generations back. Even my great-grandma on my father's side was somebody who would eat every single grain of rice. Nothing was left behind. One year for Christmas, I decided to make her this pillow full of rice, which you could heat up in the microwave and have as a warmer. 
for her hands because she was always so cold. When I handed it to her all warm, she seemed delighted, but then very quickly started to unravel what was inside. And she asked me if it was rice. And when I said yes, she seemed pretty surprised, but containing herself. And it wasn't until she died and transitioned that I found that little pillow and it was completely emptied and she had eaten the rice. So that just shows just how important food is to my family, at least to the history of my lineage. About 10 years ago, I realized I was addicted to food. If I had tried to change my diet, it just was so hard and scary and it brought up all sorts of emotions. And when I finally hit rock bottom of my health about nine years ago, I was told by my chiropractor that I was not allowed to eat certain foods. And he showed me exactly how my body was reacting with certain foods in my mouth or just even next to me, how different muscles would shut down or different muscle groups. Using applied kinesiology in this way was incredibly powerful for me to learn how to eat intuitively because I would sense in and sense whether a certain food next to my body would give me a feeling of expansion or contraction, or he would test a muscle just to give me that sort of backup so I could see whether a food was shutting down a muscle group as well. Well, of course, I was completely devastated when I was told I shouldn't eat dairy, I shouldn't eat um, sugars, cookies, sweets of any sort, even fruit at that time. I was meant to stay off of grains and any refined carbs. I didn't even know what I could eat anymore. After a while, I was getting the hang of it and I was eating pretty well and quickly my health was improving. So what I learned was that food was medicine. So over the years, I experienced my body get healthier, my soul and my spirit become healthier, my emotional space much healthier. And I knew that food was a part of it. Especially being a really sensitive human being, I learned quickly that foods could affect me greatly. It was almost as if I just turned on this switch that made me realize and have awareness for the fact that food was doing something in my body. Gradually, I released more and more attachments to certain foods that I was craving, especially when I would flow in and out of choosing the foods that I knew were healthy for me or that I knew at that time were healthy for me and choosing foods that I knew would be um, detrimental to me in some way or that would come at a cost. I would always balance this with the amount of emotional stress that I was having or physical stress that I was having. If I was more stressed in a certain day, then I would eat a little healthier. So I had this nice dance with food. People always wonder whether or not I'm vegan or vegetarian, and the truth is that I am not. I have studied Ayurveda and a little bit of Chinese medicine, and what I found in that was that for my body constitution, it is really not quite that good for me to eat only vegetables, legumes, or beans without eating meat because I can feel so ungrounded and also cold in my body. So the way that I balance that is just to eat meat a little bit more sparingly or when my body wants it. And whenever I can, I seek out meat that has been raised in a humane way and respectful way. So from farmers or treated in ways that I can respect and that I can get behind. So different times in my life, I've leaned more towards certain foods than others, certain seasons, bring out different aspects and elements in my body, um, in all of our bodies that I balance out with food. So to deepen this conversation, I actually see food as anything that you take in through any of your senses. Food is constant. Food is any sound that you hear, any smell, any touch, an experience, an emotion that you're feeling. So it can come from the inside. How we talk to ourselves and treat ourselves, as well as the activities that we're doing throughout the day, everything that we take in through our eyes, nose, ears, touch, all of that is food. Our food can be nourishing or it can be toxic or somewhere in between. 
So for me, on the heels of what I experienced as spiritual and existential crisis about eight weeks ago, where just a lot of different spiritual um, experiences and emotions were coming to the surface to be healed, as well as physical symptoms coming up with that, I was exhausted. And by the time I felt that I was rejuvenating and feeling enough rest, and it was the fire was dying down a bit, my grandma passed away. So it disrupted my rest state and I went through an entire process of grieving and being with my family. After a couple of weeks, I returned to Indonesia, but this time to an island called Lombok, which is the next door island to Bali. My first few days there were incredible. I was taking in salt water from the beaches and fresh air openness. What I experienced about this island is that it's really charming. It has lack of regulation, which gives a lot of freedom, people creating and innovating and developing the area, but it also had a downside. And for me, this downside hit me hard. It was the lack of regulation on food and the lack of fresh food. And while in Bali, it was easy to find a place you could live that had a kitchen so you could cook for yourself, in Lombok, it was a lot harder. So just looking back on my whole experience of the spiritual crisis, grandma passing away, and then heading over to a place where I just couldn't get the right nourishment, my body took quite a hit. At some point, I'd picked up something, and I knew very quickly because my gut was in a lot of pain, and I had indigestion and a couple of other digestive symptoms. And to give you an idea of the other food I was taking in besides physical food, through my mouth, I had just landed in Lombok during the middle of Ramadan, which is a holiday of fasting for Muslims. During Ramadan, the prayers over the loudspeakers coming from the mosques are about double from what they seem to be normally, and they're quite loud and often happen in the middle of the night. This was a male voice coming into my ears all the time, and just this underlying energy of a male-dominated population was starting to get to me at some level. All the while, I felt that my body was experiencing a shift in vibration and energy, and I wanted to eat differently anyway. But by the time I had picked up a bug or something, I just couldn't eat anything. That is, I couldn't eat anything without feeling awful for an entire at least 15 hours. So I'm the kind of person that thinks about, okay, is this a challenge that I want to take on spiritually? Is this something I want to release in terms of an attachment or learn a a new way of being or release some sort of limitation that I've previously had on myself? Or is this just a time where I need to take control and do something different? So in this case, was I meant to just experience something different with food and surrender to that and feel through it so that I could release it? Or was I meant to go find a place with a kitchen and cook my own food, at least whatever I could find, so that I could have it as fresh as I could make it? I didn't know the answer, but my body was pissed. It was fascinating to me that my body seemed to be forcing me to fast because that was the thing that felt the best. All the while Ramadan was going on and people were fasting. So it was just a curious thing. Was I catching in on the energy of that or what was really happening? During this process, I realized how attached I was to having healthy foods and to have foods that I cooked myself. And there's definitely a lot to that. We all know that cooking for yourself is much better than going out to a restaurant and that that should be done sparingly. So it was completely challenging that I had to eat out almost every meal. I also began to question whether or not I was meant to eat meats at this time. A friend asked me, does meat make you feel sad? And I I just had no idea. For the longest time, I felt meat was really grounding and satisfying to my body, especially being such a small person. And I started to feel a little more sensitive to what meat was doing for me. Well, more so, I 
seem to have quite a reset where I wasn't allowed to have any food so I could examine what that relationship was for me at this point. So I gave into that. I was completely willing to give up meat and to find some other vegan or vegetarian diet and figure it out. When I started to add foods back in, I just started with fruit and it still made my body really upset. So I knew it was deeper. I knew I had to go to the spiritual and emotional level to see what was underneath all of it. Up until this time, it was just so painful that I didn't even want to pay attention to what was going on inside. So I sat with myself and tuned into my gut and I spoke with it as if it were a person. And I just tuned in to see what it looked like in terms of the sensations I was feeling and what emotions were coming up. And I asked it, what are you? What came through at that time were lots of statements that I just didn't even understand. For example, I can't take it anymore. Everyone just go away. Everything just go away. I just felt grief. And the words that came were, I feel the grief of the world. All I could do was just cry. And I had no idea really why. What I later realized with my healing coach were a few different facets that were coming into play. I didn't even think of the fact that uh, this was on the heels of Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade's suicides. And what my healer said was that a lot of people are tuning in to see whether or not they want to check out. And that just hit the spot for me. It felt like this giant heaviness of, I can't live in this world, I can't be here, but it felt like it wasn't quite mine. It didn't feel like it was so connected to me, but somehow I was holding it and some part of me had space for that. As I stayed with that, it just started to dissolve, but it took some time. It was really heavy and thick. And what that energy of the world's consciousness seemed to trigger in me was my ancestry's story. What I understand about my maternal grandfather is that his parents starved to death and my grandpa and his brothers and sisters had to basically like crawl to get help and they were so weak. I don't know who helped them or what happened, but um, they did get help and they are, most of them lived a long life, but my great grandparents starved to death. So what's undigested in the family ancestry gets passed down. And that's one of the aspects that we land into this life with, not to mention that we have the remains of our soul as well and past life if we, ex if we believe in past life or if we believe in a sort of soul um, history. So whatever it is that didn't get resolved, integrated, or processed in the past remains in the gut of the soul and the literal gut of our bodies. The stomach is the holder of information of all of those things that we talked about earlier of food, anything you take in through the senses. So it made complete sense to me that here I am fasting because I can't eat. And at some point I moved into this threshold where I didn't want to eat because everything hurt so badly. And then this story of my great-grandparents starving to death comes up for me again. When a story in the soul of the family hasn't been acknowledged or honored, as I said, integrated, then it begs of that in later generations. And it's almost as if my body wanted to starve itself, that I, I was drawn towards that experience here, to know it, to know it and move forward with recognizing that it was their experience and it's not one that I have to repeat. So going back to the story of food in my family line, this is a significant moment. And it gave way for the reactions that happened afterwards where people in my family learned to nourish themselves and they had enough and they um, were able to have abundance Having good foods and a lot of food was the way that my family knew they were safe, that they knew they were alive. Food was their source of living. And that is exactly what I was grappling with. Is food my source of living? Is food my only source of living? 
And did I have to starve myself? Did I have to starve myself from life? When I work with myself emotionally, one thing kind of leads to another and I start to flush out all sorts of belief sets that go around this topic. I started to wonder, am I the one that's always suffering in the family? Do I have to suffer all the time? Do I have to be unhealthy to be seen? I remember getting a lot of attention when I wouldn't finish my dinner and was told that I couldn't leave until I finished it. And someone would have to sit there with me. It seems in retrospect that I wasn't so alone in those moments. I was getting some attention that I just desperately needed. And next to that, I remember being very sick a few times in my young life. And that was the only time I experienced a certain kind of attention that I didn't get when I wasn't sick. So I began to wonder with myself, did I, do I have the belief that I'm only allowed to be seen if I'm sick or emotionally suffering? Am I allowed to be seen in my joy, in my happiness? I knew these beliefs were resonating with me when my body would just cry and feel some relief and heat move out. So I healed another aspect of this whole thing. And by the time I got to Bali, I was just thrilled to be able to cook my own food and have fresher foods. And yet, then I started having cravings again, cravings for nuts and like a lot of them or chips or um, sweets for Swedish meatballs, which is something that I had when I was younger. So I asked myself, what am I really hungry for? What am I truly craving? But I also wanted to heal it on a body level and just let myself feel into the thing I was craving and notice the emotions that came from that if I pictured allowing myself to have that food. So at this point, a couple of other emotional pieces about food came up, but I've also been opening my awareness, my energy to the different things in my life that do nourish me, which is something I have practiced and known for some time that other things can nourish you besides food. But there's something different when the body and the viscera and the energy in you changes so that you have more available in you to be able to take in the nourishment of other things. So if any of this is resonating with you, I wanted to just talk a little bit about food and how you might explore this for yourself. If it inspires you, you might start to explore what you consider as food and what your family lineage has considered as food. What foods literally, physically, do you draw towards and which ones do you think you can have and which ones can you not have? What are the reactions you have and, and what's embedded in that? What types of food nourish your heart and your soul? See if you can make a list and just flush out all of the different thoughts you have about food, all the belief sets, how much food costs or when you can have it or what's related to food and what do you associate with it. It might just be interesting to do that and see what comes up and also start to tune in when you eat food. Notice how it feels to you. Notice what it tastes like. We know about mindful eating and taking it slowly, sensing into what you're eating, but also feel your emotions when you're eating it and afterwards. Notice what foods make you feel happy or what makes you feel sad or heavy. When your body's in balance, it knows exactly what it needs to eat so that it can stay in balance. Do you have cravings that come or foods that you just want a lot of or foods that you are addicted to? If you would like to explore your family ancestry's food story, what you've been handed as far as your relationship to food or to talk to your gut and explore what's going on in there, or if you want to work through cravings, check out the following three healing experiences that I'll put out in each a separate podcast later this week so that you can practice, explore, and move through an embodied exercise around your attachments to food and, and what's held in your body. Exploring this and moving through some of these practices can give you a newfound freedom with food as well as what nourishes you and what's draining you or being toxic to your life, as well as give you a new freedom 
a disconnection from things that limit you or things that you feel that you need to have in your life or else, that can free up a lot of energy and give you even more vitality in your life so that you can find what's even clearer and more you in your life. So while this exploration might be interesting to you, it might be heavy or emotional or sometimes distressing because so much is embedded in food and nourishment, love and how we receive love or haven't received love. All of that might come up. Just be kind to yourself and remember to add in a touch of play and amusement and lightness so that you can witness yourself. So I hope that this story and these tips have been interesting for you. Stay tuned in this next week for the three different healing experiences that I'll share with you. And as always, feel free to reach out if you need some support with it or if you have any thoughts or questions. And if this or other episodes have spoken to you or you like what I'm doing here and would like to support, please go to CandiceWu.com slash Patreon to make a donation of any amount. I'm so appreciative of you considering that and every single cent just goes towards this podcast and all of the things that I create for my heart. Thank you so much. And as always, you can sign up for my newsletter to become a part of the Embody community and receive meditations, healing tips, and self-love tips. And as we leave today, I'm just sending you lots of love to nourish your spirit. Take care and see you next time.